Come on in, everyone. It's time to start. <laughs> Good morning. Good morning. Welcome, everyone. And I see Angie and Rod and family back there. We're so glad to see you. Okay, let's uh, uh, let's uh, pray. Lord, we just thank you for this day that we can come and worship you. Uh, Lord, we just pray that you would uh, come and inhabit the praises of your people this morning. Lord, we lift our hearts to you, our voices to you. We worship you and praise you. Um, Lord, we just pray that you would be with Mark and, and April this morning as they uh, lead worship and bring the message. Lord, just uh, anoint them this morning with your power. Uh, just honor them and um, in their serving. Uh, give them joy in their serving. Uh, but Lord, we just come to worship you this morning uh, and just come join us, Lord. In Jesus' name, amen. So this morning we have uh, April and Mark here. They're with the YWAM um, uh, at Discovery Bay. And uh, April, thank you. She's going to uh, lead worship this morning. Then Mark's going to um, bring a message this morning and whatever God's laid on his heart. And uh, they're one of the missions that we support, and we uh, like to give them a chance to uh, come and visit every so often and find out what's going on. And then uh, also, um, he's going to be uh, uh, doing the sermon this morning also. So, all right. Well, um, come on. Let's get started. <laughs> appreciate it and love going to churches and and uh, worshiping our Lord and King and um, I was reading in Psalms 33 and I was like what I love that verse oh I love that verse I love it. okay I'm gonna do Psalms 33 okay most of it so it says let the godly sing for joy to the Lord it is fitting for the pure to praise him Praise the Lord with melodies of the lyre. Make music for him on the stringed harp. Sing a new song of praise to him. We might do a new song you guys don't know. So we, yes, Lord, sing a new song of praise to him. Play skillfully on the harp and sing with joy. For the word of the Lord holds true, and we can trust everything he does. Amen? Amen. He loves whatever is just and good. The unfailing love of the Lord fills the earth. The Lord merely spoke and the heavens were created. He breathed the word and all the stars were born. He assigned the sea and the boundaries and locked the oceans in vast reservoirs. Let the whole earth fear the Lord. Let everyone stand in awe of him. For when he spoke, the world began. It appeared at his command. The Lord frustrates the plans of the nations and thwarts all their schemes. Oh, yes, Lord, we need that. But the Lord's plans stand firm forever. His intentions can never be shaken. What joy! For the nations whose God is the Lord, whose people he hath chosen as his inheritance. The Lord looks down from heaven. He sees the whole human race. From his throne he observes all who live on the earth. He made their hearts so he understands everything they do. The Lord watches over those who fear him those who rely on his unfailing love. Okay, last three verses. We put our hope in the Lord. He is our help and our shield. In him our hearts rejoice. 
for we trust in his holy name. Let your unfailing love surround us, Lord, for our hope is in you alone. Amen. 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 We are so honored, aren't we, to serve an amazing living God. Yes, thank you. He's so good. <laughs> Thank you. 
We well, welcome, I forgot to welcome our online people uh, and we welcome all of our visitors this morning. Um, we have some blue cards in the back pockets of the chairs. Um, if you can fill that out and drop it in our offering box in the foyer. Um, we'd love to connect with you. You can also put your prayer requests on those blue cards. And uh, so, um, and if you're prepared to, uh, with your offerings this morning, uh, just drop those uh, in the offering box or you can use our GCD app uh, you can visit our website, or you can mail it here to the church. Um, so let's pray over the offering. Lord, uh, we just thank you through your uh, great goodness that we see all over our lives. Lord, we just pray that um, we would come to you with grateful hearts, that we'd be great stewards of all that you've entrusted to us, our time, our talent, and our treasure. Lord, just pray that we would use them for your honor and your glory and to further your kingdom. want to stand with us again? Yeah. Psalms 23. Who, who likes Psalms 23? Yes, amen.
are so worthy of all of our praise, so worthy of everything that you do, Father, and everything that you have done, everything that you will do, Father. We praise you and thank you. In your name we pray, amen. Amen. Well, good morning. Uh, there's a mic, there's a mute switch on the top of that. Uh, on. Okay, there, there you go. <laughs> you, you folks are so blessed. I, I, um, your pastor is just an amazing teacher. I think you, uh, I know you appreciate him. And uh, I, I watched online last Sunday and uh, the, the flowers were just amazing. Who put those up here? That's just... Uh, Becky, oh, that, that, oh, I had some helpers. <laughs> oh, okay, yeah, it was beautiful. 
It's like, you know, like too bad they couldn't stay the here. Oh, okay. Yeah, well, uh, I want to introduce you to YWAM a little bit. Uh, YWAM is the world's largest mission sending organization. We specialize in short-term missions, which is generally focused at young people. You may look at me and say, well, you're not so young. <laughs> but, uh, you know, we, we thought about doing SWAM seniors with the mission. But, you know, it's a, um, but uh, YWAM, you know, we do, there are a lot of young people in there. It, it's a good way to introduce people to missions, young people to missions. And many do go back out and do long-term missions. We've got over 100, 100 and, no, 18,000 staff, full-time staff all over the world. Many, I, more, there are more actually overseas individuals than there are Americans sent out. So this is truly a global mission with over uh, 180, no, how many campuses? 180 nations, 18,000 staff, and I'm trying to remember how many campuses we've got. It's a lot. Okay, but um, YWAM is really an amazing ministry. We've, uh, you, if you can imagine a way to minister, it's there. There's a, there are surfing ministries, there are skateboarding ministries, there are um, drama teams, all kinds of things. Uh, very creative. But what, what was really amazing is YWAM and this is really the, um, the uh, where YWAM stands out, short-term missions comes into play, is that, uh, you know, back in the Munich Olympics in 1972, they were going out and um, uh, proclaiming the gospel. Anyway, then, then the uh, shootings happened. And all of a sudden, people said, well, where are the Jesus people? We want to go talk to them. So they were there and were able to minister where, you know, because there was a large presence there for the Olympics. Uh, they were there to, able to minister to people. When the Soviet Union fell, all of a sudden YWAM was there to send missionaries into Russia and all those uh, Eastern Bloc countries. When Afghanistan fell, there were missionaries that went into Afghanistan behind the soldiers and Iraq. Um, some of them just barely got out. I don't know if all of them are out of Afghanistan. I think so. Uh, last I heard, um, they were getting them out. But uh, so there are mission missionaries in YWAM all over the world in many countries that we can't even admit. Um, a lot of them doing teaching English as a second language, whatever, um, or just um, doing businesses, things like that. But, uh, but they're doing ministry. People are coming to know the Lord through YWAM, and it's exciting. Uh, we have three categories. I'm not following the script on there. There is evangelism and training and mercy ministries. So those are the three. Mercy ministries, we have ships that actually go around and do minor surgeries and uh, provide medicine to remote islands, remote places. Papua New Guinea is huge right now in that, and the islands of the Pacific. And uh, uh, trying to think here what, uh, yeah, one, one focus that we have in, um, from ships is to send out, well, not just from ships, but to go and and distribute the Bible. We've got oral Bible translation, so we have a strong push to get the Bible into every mother tongue on, on earth. Because people, they can read the Bible in a second language they learned, but it doesn't have the impact that their mother tongue has. And so we have actually, our ships is taking these containers over that are you know basically sound booths over, and they're getting locals to come read the scripture in, you know, people that are bilingual, they read the scripture, they get a few of them, and then they compare their translations to make sure that it's accurate. But uh, that's something that I think we have a three-year goal, is it three? To, to get the Bible in every language on earth. 
And uh, we're working with, with Wycliffe and other Bible <laughs> translators. So it's an exciting ministry to be a part of, and we are just so blessed and grateful to be a part of it. So what, uh, if you can move the slides forward. Yeah, there's a place for everyone, as you can see, even for older folks. Um, oh, I didn't introduce my wife. Well, you, you saw her singing. Uh, so Mark and April, just like March and April, it's Mark and April. <laughs> and our daughter, Elon, she's been in eight different countries. Yeah, she did her DTS, her initial school in Perth, Australia, and did an outreach to Europe, and has been in Mexico, and uh, yeah, a few other places, more places than I've been. Um, so, yeah, why, if, if you'd like to find out more information on YWAM, it's ywam.org, or ywamdb.com is Discovery Bay. We are much smaller here, and uh, right now we're focused on summer camps, church camps that come over, and uh, we host them. And uh, it's, it's a neat ministry to be part of. We've got a few projects. If anyone's interested in helping with any projects that we're going to do this summer, I'd be glad to talk to you. Uh, but um, so we're going to replace a roof on, on one building. So... Um, I guess we should get into the message, right? Okay. Yeah. Well, he is risen. Yeah. Yes. It's exciting. I mean, this is, we're going to have breakfast with Jesus. And that is, um, it's, this is the, where this takes place is right after Jesus had gone to the cross and was resurrected. And he had appeared to the disciples. You know, if you look in, uh, in John 20, you know, in the story of Thomas, you look and read it, and it's like, wow, this reads like this is the end of the book. But it's not. So John actually wrote the first 20 chapters of John. And then sometime later, he wrote this chapter 21 as an epilogue. And I'm, we are so glad he did, because what he gave us is just an amazing story. You know, he had obviously had a burning desire and a strong conviction, tug at his heart, just like the Holy Spirit speaks to us today. He spoke to John, and John said, I got to put that in the book. It's such a part of it. And uh, it really provides a bookend, because we have two stories of the fishing boats. If you think there's one, if for many years I thought there was one. I wasn't paying attention. Oh, I've heard that story before. No, there are actually two events that happen. One at the beginning and one at the end. After Jesus, not the end, but after Jesus had gone to the cross. So to set the stage a little bit, we have Matthew 28 that references that Jesus had directed them to meet on a mountain in Galilee. And... Uh, but that's not where they were. They weren't on this mountain. Luke 24, 34 says that uh, Jesus met with Peter personally after the resurrection. So this event would have taken place after that. I'm trying to give you a little backstory here. And in Mark 16, 14, he says, it says, He rebuked them for their unbelief and hardness of heart because they had not believed those who saw him after he had risen. So you've got to get kind of put yourself in this position. So Jesus had died, you know, Peter, he had denied Jesus three times. Jesus saw him, he rebuked him. There wasn't encouragement at this point. So Peter was feeling pretty bad, and I'm sure the other disciples were as well. Peter was not in a good place. Um, Matthew 20, Jesus said in Matthew 28, 10, do not be afraid, go and tell my brothers to go to Galilee, and there they will see me. So they're in Galilee, but Jesus hadn't shown up yet. I'm not sure what they were thinking. Were they thinking that he uh, had stood them up, or was he, were they thinking that he couldn't really use them, like they had failed him? Uh, but... Um, 
Uh, I'll go ahead and start reading John chapter 21. Now, this is in the ESV. I've also got New King James, so I might be reading some of both. Most likely, I'll stick with ESV. So it says, After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, and he revealed himself this way. Simon Peter, Thomas, called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that would be James and John, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. Then they said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into a boat, but that night they caught nothing. Now I've wondered, well, where did they get the boat? I mean, was it sitting there for three years? I don't know. But I'm sure they, that, that's, we won't know that one. But if you look at the slide here next, it's a map. The Sea of Tiberias is the same as the Sea of Galilee and the same as the Lake Gennesaret. So those are all interchangeable names for the same place. Um, if you're wondering why they fished at night, they would put their torches on the boat, go out, and the fish were attracted to the lights. And so they'd come to the boat. Nice, easy way to do it. You don't get uh, exposure, too. And if you want to get your fish to the markets in the morning, you would fish at night. So it's as fresh as you could get it. So those are some reasons they were out there. It's like, why would they go fishing at night? Well, it's interesting that John doesn't mention the names of the two disciples. Um, they may have been omitted for, uh, just for their protection. I mean, we've got to remember this was a time of heavy persecution of the church. So to give away the whereabouts of somebody at a specific time could be a problem. And you see that mentioned, you know, there, where somebody's name is omitted, it's usually for their protection. Um, I'm sure it wasn't a Gilligan's Island theme song issue or anything. I don't know if you guys remember that and the rest. Okay, so down here in verse 4, it says, Just as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore, yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, Children, do you have any fish? They answered him, No. So these were honest fishermen. They didn't have fish stories. He said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. So let's take a look at the boat. This boat was found in 2000, or excuse me, 1986. It's a Galilean fishing boat. It, um, the waters receded you know, for a drought and uh, disappeared. But it's about 27 feet long by uh, seven and a half feet wide. So if you, there's one more photo of a uh, model. So it would have looked similar, something like that. Um, so Jesus is asking them to cast their boat seven or their net seven and a half feet away. They didn't know it was Jesus at this point. So seven and a half feet. So one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Yeah, right around here from there. Yeah. So we're going to throw our net over there. And that's going to make the difference? Uh, who here would have said, you're crazy. Why would I do that? It's not worth my effort. But you've got to think that these guys had spent three, and a, three years with Jesus, and they were humbled. I mean, they were incredibly humbled by their life with him. They didn't know what to expect. They were... They just were expectantly waiting for something to happen just by obedience. And that's really how we should be, isn't it? Um, so without arguing, they said, well, what have we got to lose? They went, took that net, dropped it on the other side of the boat. And at that point, there were more fish than they could catch. You know, it, it, the net was full of large fish. And, uh, you know, I wonder when deja vu kicked in here. It's like, haven't we been here before? 
Yeah. Um, so, yes, it did happen. Let's look at Luke chapter 5, verse 5. We'll, we'll read this story and pay attention if, you know, not that you're not paying attention, but just I want you to listen to these two stories because I'm going to ask you if you can pick out the similarities and the differences between these two. So, on one occasion, while the crowd was pressing in on him to hear the word of God, he was standing by the lake of Gennesaret, and he saw two boats by the lake. But the fishermen had gone out of them and were washing their nets. Getting into one of the boats, which was Simon's, he asked him to put out a little from the land. And he sat down and taught the people from the boat. There's kind of a loudspeaker effect, you know, when you're out there on the water, it just reflects. Uh, when he had finished speaking, he said to Simon, Put out into the deep and let your nets down for your, let down your nets for a catch. And Simon answered, Master, we toiled all night and took nothing. But at your word, I will let down the nets. And when they had done this, they enclosed a large number of fish, and their nets were breaking. They signaled to their partners in the other boat to come and help them. And they came and filled both the boats so that they began to sink. But when Simon Peter saw it, he fell down at Jesus' knees, saying, Depart from me, for I am a sinful man, O Lord. For he and all who were with him were astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And so also were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, who were partners with Simon. And Jesus said to Simon, Do not be afraid. From now on you will be catching men. And when they had brought their boats to land, they left everything and followed him. So we see that story from the beginning of Jesus' ministry being repeated at his, after his resurrection. So what message was Jesus trying to give them? I'll go ahead back to John 21. It says, so they cast it. So this is the other story. Don't, know, I'm, don't want to confuse you here. So this is the later one, after Jesus was resurrected. They cast it, and now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of the fish. That disciple whom Jesus loved, it's a, you're probably familiar, I'm sure Caleb mentions it, Pastor Caleb, that um, John always wrote that. He was the disciple Jesus loved. He gets a little creative, and he, he'll get a little creative down below. Quite an interesting writer, but amazing. Um, where was I? Yeah, there we go. Therefore, the, the disciple whom Jesus loved, therefore said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, I'm surprised he didn't realize it before. He must have been thinking, yeah, this is, look, looks really weird, really familiar. Um, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped for work and threw himself into the sea. So he probably had a loincloth or something and realized he was underdressed for the occasion. So he put on his clothes to swim. Yeah. So he was excited. It's like, this, I can't wait to see Jesus. The other disciples on the boat came in the boat dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from land, about a hundred yards off. When they got out on land, they saw a charcoal fire in place with fish laid, on it, laid out on it and bread. Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Now, I don't know how long it takes to make charcoal. I don't know, maybe some of you probably do. But it takes a while. Unless Jesus did some miraculous thing where we, all of a sudden we have this charcoal fire. He, he would have been there a couple hours at least. Wouldn't I, am I right? Quite a while. Making the bread, getting the charcoals ready. Um, so he, you know, he waits for us. Just like he was waiting for them. I want you to just realize he waits for us. So down here in verse 11, it says, So Simon Peter went aboard and hollowed the net to the shore. 
full of large fish, 153 of them. And although there were so many, the net was not torn. So what uh, can you pick out? What are some similarities between the two? Do you mind uh, raising your hand and giving answers? What are some similarities between the two events? Okay, yeah, those, that's a difference, yes. Well, you can, you can give both, that's fine. Similarities, difference? Large amount of fish. Large amount of fish, yeah. Spontaneous uh, obedience. Spontaneous obedience, good. Okay, well, I, um, I have a few. But uh, I'm also, you know, let me, before I get into those, you know, the, it does mention 153 and the different messages I've heard on this. Pastors don't know, but know why it says 153 except that it's a lot. But I did look up and I found it in, uh, it was a Catholic site on the, uh, and he was a Jewish historian. <laughs> It's pretty interesting. It's the most compelling reason that I found uh, is that yeah, they still do it today in some places, but uh, in first century Israel, they would have every every week at the synagogue they would well they would split up the Torah, the first five books of the Bible, the books of Moses, the Law. I mean, you could call them any one of those. They'd split it up into 153 parts. So every three years, they would read through the whole Torah or the whole books of the law. So it, the Hebrew calendar is 51 weeks about. So that, that would be 153. So Jesus may have been saying, this is the completion of the law. We finally completed it. Where, and, and you look at the net being torn in the first one, not torn in the second one. So the law had not been completed. Now the law is completed. I'm not saying for sure that's the reason, but it sure makes good sense to me. Um, and also, coals, charcoal. You know, you, there's so much in here. It's so detailed that uh, you've got to pick out, even the little details um, mean something. Charcoal fire. Uh, remember the story about Isaiah where, they, where uh, the angel took a coal and touched his tongue and he was, he was made holy? So there's, uh, I don't know if you've heard of Ray Vanderland, uh, that the world may know. It's been a while since he, he did some, but... Uh, he came to our church once and he said, you know, that, that signifies holiness. And um, so here Jesus was in a holy place. He made this a holy ground for them to have a time to spend with him. So it also would signify a completion there. So verse 12, it says, Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them, and so with the fish. Now, this was the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he raised from the dead. So I'm going to go back to the similarities and the differences. Um, so here are some similarities both times. The disciples fished all night and caught nothing. They exhausted their own energies. Both times, the nets, there were two boats. Both were needed. Both times, Jesus asked their, them to throw in their nets again. And both times, after obedience, they caught more than they could handle. So when they were, had, had exhausted their own strength, they did it under his authority, and blessings came. Differences. The net broke, and the net didn't break. I, I went into that. Peter wanted Jesus to leave 
in the first event. He wanted Jesus to leave because he was an evil man. Versus the second time. What? He couldn't wait to see Jesus. He swam without hesitation. Now, the first one, there was a crowd at the beginning. The second time, it was a very intimate, private setting. And then fish, not specified, versus 153. And then the charcoal fire. So, you know, come and have breakfast. Jesus was inviting them. This was, you can look at this to say this was a new beginning. Jesus wanted to take them back to that that point in time where they first met him and renew, start over again. You know, Jesus is saying, come and share life with me. And that's what, what happens with communion. You know, we're going to do that this morning. He's saying, come share life with me. You know, Jesus wanted to remind them that he still loved them. You know, it was... This time was forgiveness without words. He was saying, hey, I love you. I still want you. I still want to be a part of your life. Okay, let's go down to verse 15. Jesus and Peter. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John. You notice he says Simon. He, doesn't, he had changed his name to Peter. But I think that was another reference to wanting to take him back to the beginning, to remind him of what he was like at the beginning. Do you love me more than these? He actually said in Greek, says agape. So Jesus said, do you have undying love for me, a self-sacrificial love? And... Uh, do you love me more than these? And we don't know what he's saying, these. It could have been the fish. It could have been the, the fishing lifestyle, the, the, uh, the disciples. It doesn't specify. But he said to him, yes, Lord, do you know that I love you? And he's saying, phileo. So he said, Jesus says, do you love me with undying love? And then he's saying, yeah, I, I like you a lot. I love you like a brother. Um, so, you know, we, we might fault Peter, but I think he's just being honest. Because here he, said, he had said, I will never leave you at, at a previous time. But now he's being just as honest as he could be. And he said to him, feed my lamb. He said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Agape, he said again. He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I like you. He said to him, tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you like me? Do you phileo me? So Jesus stepped it down, came down to that, that, uh, that point. He said, do you like me? And Peter was grieved because he had said it the third time. Do you love me? And he said to the Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you, that I like you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, you used to dress yourself and walk where you wanted. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you do not want to go. This he said to show what kind of death he was to glorify God. And after saying this, he said to him, follow me. So even though Peter said, I like you a lot, Jesus still said, feed my sheep. So this brings me to my point number one here, is that even if we just like Jesus as a friend right now, that's a start. He can still work with that. If we can't bring ourselves to this undying love, he can still work with it. 
Do you like him? Well, obviously you're here. I would think you do. But he can use that. You know, in South Africa, we were uh, doing an outreach to day laborers. You know, the guys that were waiting for day jobs. And uh, we gave a message with a multicolored bracelet that, you know, showed different, the message of salvation with black, stood for sin, red stands for the blood of Jesus, white stands for being made whole. That, um, and uh, anyway, this man, now there, was, there were a number of them that made decisions for Jesus. But this one man, he, uh, he made a decision for Jesus. And he, then he asked for prayer to be healed. Anyway, prayed for him. Some of the people on our team prayed for him, and he said he was healed. He said, you know, can I have one of those bracelets to take back to my wife so I can heal her? But, no, this isn't a lucky charm here. This is just representative, you know. Um, so he, um, our, our translator, she said, now, are you, do you worship your ancestors? And he said, yeah. She said, you know, God doesn't, he doesn't have other gods there with him. He's, he's God alone. Um, you need to go home and get rid of, I'm not going to give you a bracelet. You can go home, get rid of all your ancestral worship trinkets, whatever they are. And then pray for your wife and see if God heals her. He came back the next week. He was so excited. He was dancing all around. And he said, I was healed. And he said, I prayed. I did. I got rid of all my ancestral worship items. And I prayed for my wife, and her hand that was shriveled up was restored. I wish I could have seen that. That just would have, yeah, that would have been so exciting. But, I mean, it was exciting to, to hear this story. But, you see, at this point, when, when we met him, he was still worshiping. When he made the decision for Jesus, he was worshiping two gods. He thought that he could have both Jesus and his ancestors. Um, see, this, this is my second point, and it's not in this chapter, but God is God alone. You know, if you look in Exodus chapter 20, the Ten Commandments, verses 3 and 4, the first two commandments are to you, God, no other gods above God, and no other gods next to God. That's it. It's, um, he is to be worshipped in him alone. So many say they love Jesus. But who is the Jesus they love? You know, if we don't believe the Bible, the word of God, then we're believing, you know, say, oh, I, I don't believe Jesus would do that. Jesus wouldn't call this sin. This, you know, we're making up Jesus at that point. We're making up a fake Jesus. We either believe what he says about himself, or this is an idol. It becomes an idol. So we have to go back to the word. It's, it's critical. Um, otherwise, it, we're believing a lie. So... Third point here is that we are called to action. You know, even if you just like Jesus, he still says, feed my sheep. So, you know, what, what can that mean in our lives today? He says, feed my sheep. He's calling us to do something. It might be going on a mission. It might be giving. It might be helping at church. I don't know. You can throw some other items in. Uh, what did I put down here? I had a few things. Just sharing what we're learning. Um, could be, you know, just standing up for what's right at the workplace, in your family, whatever, without backing down. To be men and women of honor, of integrity, to do what we to do what we say we're going to do. That feeds the sheep, because people are watching us. We are, um, 
Yeah, we are an encouragement to people in the faith if we're doing the right thing. So, so like Peter, even if you haven't done the right thing, this can be a new beginning. Jesus wanted to take him back to that first place where he fell in love with Jesus to start him again. So, the reboot of sorts. So do you feel like you've let God down? That he can't use you? Well, let him take you back to where, you, where he started with you and start with him again. So I'd like to thank you so much for uh, letting me come and speak. But uh, that's, that's it.
Father, we just are so grateful for you. That you are a God of new beginnings. You can start working us again if we fail you. <laughs> that you don't look at us as failures. If we just are obedient, we just seek after you. That you want to use us. You don't need our help, but you want our help. You want our participation. Just praise you for who you are. You're a God of love, a God of mercy, a God of holiness and righteousness. We praise you. God's so good. Amen. I mean, it, it just amazes me how good he is. And then uh, I, I'm even overwhelmed sometimes when I'm sitting there and I think of being here amongst you and uh, knowing God has brought me here and, and uh, that he loves us. You know, it's amazing. <clears throat> anyway, I was asked to do this, so this is my first go-around. <clears throat> uh, nothing is hidden from God. He knows it all. You can't hide anything from Him. And He says, all have sinned and fall short of His glory. And uh, uh, Peter, or not Peter, John, when he saw Jesus walking, he says, Behold, the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world. And he took upon himself the sin of the whole world. That includes you and me. <clears throat> and, uh, and the whole world, actually. So, in uh, taking God for his word, uh, You know, I think of Mary, when Gabriel came and <clears throat> told her all that was going to happen. She says, let it be done according to your word. And then, as you shared, Peter says, uh, according to your word, he followed his obedience. <clears throat> and uh, anyway, okay, so what's next? <laughs> Let us confess our sins against God and our neighbors. We confess that we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. By what we have done, and by what we have left undone, we have not loved you with all our heart. We have not loved our neighbors as ourselves. We are truly sorry, and we humbly for the sake of your Son, Jesus Christ, have mercy on us and forgive us, that we may delight in your will and walk in your ways to the glory of your name. Amen. And this is the assurance from John 1.9. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So uh, let us reflect on uh, anything that comes to mind that uh, we think we have done to grieve, grieve our Lord. And, uh, and I want to 
just a picture uh, our grievances and uh, just take them and nail them on the cross and leave them there and forget them and, uh, and just go on. So let's uh, just take a time to reflect on God's mercy and, and uh, his forgiveness for us, Lord. So we're going to uh, this represents represents the body of Christ that was broken for us. It seems so insignificant taking this and breaking it apart because Christ has, uh, but He said to do this in remembrance of Him. And uh, what he accomplished on the cross is uh, uncomprehendable in our natural minds. But he's, he's placed his spirit within us to, to relish and to, and to know that uh, he did pay the price for us. And uh, the atoning blood the blood of the Lamb, it does take away the sin of the world. The way I see it, he, uh, he stripped us of our old filthy garments. We stand before him naked and bare, nothing hidden. And he takes the atoning blood of Christ and pours it on us and cleanses us from all unrighteousness and sin. And then he takes a robe of righteousness and places it upon us. <clears throat> and we stand before him in his righteousness and in his holiness by what he's done. It's an amazing thing. So, uh, invite the stewards up. And
Okay, uh, I guess I'll, that's not going to all be missions. I'll talk to all the announcements. But the first one is the package made it to, on the train to Elizabeth, New Jersey, got on a truck, made it up to New York, and it's sitting there. The ship uh, came up from Africa, and I watched it on the map, and it went into Charleston, and then somebody thinks maybe it was supposed to go to Baltimore, because instead it went out in the ocean and parked when it's sitting there circling around to anchor, waiting for its next stop. It's supposed to pick up our stuff in uh, New York and uh, cross the Atlantic between the 12th and the 30th, and then it'll head across Europe. So things are moving along. Um, nobody's called me about being a uh, framer. <laughs> Still listening. Uh, but anyway, everything's going good, and I'm, I'm real happy with that, and I'm, I hope you are too. Next. Uh, after this, we have our fellowship, so please join us downstairs. Um, it seemed like the sermon was correct. We never meet without some food. Uh, the next one is uh, we have our prayer ministry, and I believe it's uh, Mary D., but I don't see Mary D. Okay, it'll be Becky today. So if you have any concerns or prayers or just want some support, please come up front and let her uh, pray with you. Okay, and then the Tulip Festival, so all you guys, be sure and sign up, and uh, you can bring your wives, girlfriends, whoever you want to go look at the flowers, it's up to you. And then at the end, oh, wait, wait. I just want to say something, just microphone. Oh, sorry. Thanks. Yeah, so, so the, uh, we've got quite a few people who have signed up, which is really exciting, and we've got some drivers signed up. So we need to have everyone sign up no later than Wednesday so that we can know how many cars we have going and we can make reservations and maybe buy the tickets in advance. So just make sure you sign up if you're planning on going. It should be a lot of fun and men can come too. Okay, <laughs> okay and uh, with that, uh, don't go, to, uh, go to the benediction and uh, it's, uh, here we go. <laughs> now may the God of peace who through the blood of the eternal covenant brought back from the dead our Lord Jesus Christ, that great shepherd of the sheep, who equipped you, who will equip you with everything good for doing his will, and may he work in us what is pleasing to him through Jesus Christ, to whom be the glory forever and ever. Grace be with you all this week, and look forward to seeing you next week. And, and before you break, I just want to thank uh, the, uh, April and uh, Mark for leading our service today. And please come down and join us. <laughs>